What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Riddell and in today's video I'm going to recommend a possible chess opening system for black against the move b4. Now I am just warning all the move I'm about to suggest looks absolutely crazy and goes against normal chess opening strategy and hardly anyone plays it but it works. Here's what the b4 player wants you to do. They want you to play a normal move like e5 in which case they're going to play bishop b2 attacking our centralized pawn and now we have a big decision to make a lot of players don't really like playing either f6 or d6 because it seems a little bit passive so the main line here is black taking that pawn on b4 and then white going into the exchange variation with bishop takes e5 now guys if you like this variation for black that is completely okay in fact following the move knight f6 if you plug this into a computer program it's going to give you a slight advantage for black probably because we have two developed pieces and white only has one. But notice what white did here. They gave up their B pawn and in return, they got one of our two very important centralized pawns. The reason I don't really like going into this variation is because this is what white wants. They are very comfortable with this position and there's a good chance that they're gonna know it much better than I do. So going back to this position, I see my opponent play the move B4. I don't wanna give them my centralized pawn. Let me give them my A pawn with A5. I don't know if you guys have watched the Coffee Chess YouTube channel, but if you have, you have probably heard of FM Mark the Duck. Now he plays moves like G4 with the Grob and also B4 with the Polish. Against B4, I always respond to him with E5. And I've got some pretty good opening and middle game positions out of this move. And notice here, if white tries to defend the pawn on B4 with a move like C3, I mean, what are we doing here? B4, C3, white has a very awkward game, and it's going to be very hard for that knight and that rook, as well as the bishop on C1, to get involved following that move. If white plays the move A3, we're simply going to take that pawn on B4, and following A takes B4, we say thank you for the rook. So really in this position, white needs to play either taking that pawn or the move B5. And it actually turns out that B5 is the only move here in this position that gives white a fighting chance. What happens if white just takes our pawn on a5? Well, in this case, we are going to take full control of the center of the board with e5. And following the move bishop b2, we can now play knight c6. Now, notice before, when the pawn was on b4, white here could have played b5 attacking our knight. But now we have officially distracted that pawn. We can play knight c6 and just play normal developmental chess. I mean, following a move like e3, we can play knight f6. And the very next move, I mean, let's say white plays something like knight f3, we can now play rook takes a5. Definitely not a normal move, guys, having a rook at a5 at move 5 in the game. But I really do like this rook here. It's very hard for white to attack this rook successfully. And it has a very nice open file and is serving as a defender for our pawn on e5, which is really giving us that space advantage in the center of the board. I mean, if white does play a move like bishop c3, we just continue to develop with bishop b4. And if a move like knight c3 here, we can actually steamroll white with e4, attacking that knight on f3. If a move like knight d4, we can take that knight off the board, continue to advance in the center of the board with a move like d5, following bishop e2, play bishop d6. We have a very active bishop here here, on d6 and c8 and i love black's game so y'all against the move a5 it's really not recommended for white to take this pawn on a5 because we're simply going to take full control of the center of the board and black has nothing to worry about now because of this whenever i do play this against fm mark the duck he continues with b5 expanding down the queen side of the board and really in this position i think a must move here for black is d Notice here with our pawns on d5 and a5, we are starting to really put a presence on that fourth rank. And usually here, you're going to see white continue with their usual plan of bishop b2, which is a good move. I mean, putting this bishop on this very long and strong diagonal. And now as black, I'm going to be showing you guys two options that you can play in your own games in this position. You can either play a4, expanding down the queen side, or even c5, really trying to take control of that center. Let's first cover the move a4. 
Really the whole point of this is that if white ever does play the move knight c3, we can play a3 kicking that bishop back to c1. So usually in this position you're going to see white play a move like e3, in which case we can simply develop with a move like bishop f5. Notice again, if knight c3, we have a3 kicking that bishop back, e6, and all of a sudden we have a very strong pawn on a3 supported by two of our pieces which hadn't even had to move yet. And notice here how this bishop cannot move, making this very cramped and difficult for white in this position. So usually you're not going to see white just play a move like knight c3 because of a3. So you're going to see white play a3, in which case we can now play e6, continue with a move like knight d7 if bishop e2, continue with h6. Notice here how we're just naturally developing our pieces. I mean, against a move like castle and kingside, we're going to bring our knight out to f6. And if white ever does play the move c4, we have nothing to worry about. We're going to continue by playing bishop e7 and following knight c3. Yes, white has got a little bit of a space advantage on the queen side of the board. Notice we have as well. However, by pushing their pawn all the way down to b5, we really do have a good control of the dark squares of b6, c5, and a5. So in this position, we can play knight b6 attacking the pawn on c4 as well as defending that pawn on d5 i mean following a move like c takes d5 here which is by far white's best option we're going to take back with our e-pawn and now if white plays a move like knight d4 that's okay we're going to bring our bishop back to h7 continue to improve the positioning of our pieces with a move like bishop d6 notice how this bishop on d6 is much more active than our bishop was on e7 and against a move like d3 trying to really control e4 and c4 which both of our knights are attacking we can simply continue with queen e7 and this is also another advantage of playing this a4 line is that it really does force white to play a3 unless they don't want to move this knight for the rest of the game most people do want to use their knight and their rook so usually you're going to see the move a3 but the issue with this is that once a3 is played and this rook runs away we're able to simply gang up on that pawn, force white to play a move like knight b1, and no Polish player is looking for a position like this going into the middle game. So y'all, that covers the move a4 against bishop b2, really forcing white to make that decision. Do they not want to move their knight and rook for the rest of the game, or do they want to play a3 and create a weakness? Another option that I really like here for black, which you guys can play if you prefer it, is c5, expanding down the queen side of the board. And similar to earlier, I mean, these pawns here are really making a presence on that fourth rank following a move like e3. We're going to continue to develop, but let's first cover what happens if white uses the rule of en passant with b takes c6. I personally like taking back with the b pawn, and then after that, just naturally developing. We're going to play knight f6, bring our knight to d7 against a move like bishop e2, play rook b8, taking control of this very nice file. And now if a move like bishop a3... We can simply play e5, taking full control of the center of the board. And some of you guys may be wondering, wait a second, what happens if bishop takes f8? I mean, our knight can't take because a knight takes e5. And if our rook takes, our king can't castle. And it's kind of awkward on that e8 square. Well, in this situation, we're actually going to take back with the king. And usually we don't want to make it so that we can't castle. But in a position like this, we're simply eventually going to continue with moves like g6 and king g7 and black is completely okay not to mention our very strong center i do think that white needs to try to find a way here to undermine the center with a move like c4 but against this we can now play d4 expanding in the center of the board notice here after the move e takes d4 and e takes c4 if white plays a move like d3 we're simply going to play c5 and black has an amazing game there all the pawns on the dark squares and our bishop on a light square not to mention our active rook our knights are going to get more evolved i like black's game but what happens if white takes that pawn on d4 i mean isn't white just ahead of pawn well again we are ahead in development here and can play the move knight e5 attacking the queen and now against the move like knight c2 play knight d3 with check whole idea being after bishop takes knight we're going to take that bishop off the board making this a very difficult position for white. We're currently preventing this king from castling, and notice if a move like queen e2 is played, we simply win that knight. This is a very difficult position to play with as the white pieces. Many players may play something like knight b a3, just trying to free up that queen e2 option, but now we just play bishop f5, ready to bring our rook to e8. We have a very active position here, and white is on the brink of losing this game.
So that covers what happens if white uses the rule of en passant. We're simply going to take that pawn back, continue to develop, really try to take full control of the center of the board, put our rook on b8, and black is in business. Now what happens if white just ignores that we played c5 and just plays a move like e3? Well, in this situation, we're going to continue with a move like knight f6, and now against a move like knight f3, play b6. Notice how we are locking up this pawn structure on the queen side of the board, and now black's game is very simple and easy. Following bishop e2, we're going to put our knight on d7, continue with e6, a move like bishop d6, activating our bishop. We're going to continue with moves like castle and kingside, bishop b7. e5 ideas are always in the air as well. And I love Black's game. Notice here if a move like d4 is played, trying to really create some kind of presence in the center of the board, attacking our pawn and really gripping that e5 square against that move. We'll just play c4, expanding on the queen side. We're now going to have full control of e4, and Black has nothing to worry about. And from a practical standpoint, I like Black's game here. Thanks for watching today's video. If you'd like to see my top five underrated chess openings for white against the Sicilian defense, click the video to the left. If you'd like to learn the overall theory behind the Vienna game, click the video to the right. Leave a comment below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.